Thank you very, very much. It's a real pleasure for me to be here with you this evening, and I uh, want to thank all of those who have uh, welcomed me here so warmly uh, and who have uh, fed me. I appreciate that uh, as well. Uh, one of the uh, real trials and tribulations of uh, serving in the Congress uh, uh, is the fact that uh, you tend to have to live in two places, and uh, I have not been home for a while, uh, so it's been kind of hard for me to get a meal. I, I kind of uh, accept speeches when I know uh, they're going to feed me. I thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, but I really, really appreciate that. I'm also uh, pleased to be here in concert with the Urban League. Uh, your president, uh, Ms. White, is a very, very good friend uh, who I've known for a long, long time, and I, I appreciate uh, doing all that I can to help uh, in this quest, and I'll talk a little bit uh, about uh, uh, that uh, this evening. Uh, Dr. Summons, thank you. Uh, and also, please thank your president for me, or uh, I guess it's the provost. Uh, you're the provost. Um, but um, I am just getting over, I hope, uh, something myself. And so please thank her for not showing up this evening. Huh? <laughs> uh, send, a, send a note. Just don't, don't bring in the bugs. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank uh, the other co-sponsors, the 200-plus men, Mr. Gray, and um, uh, my beloved uh, fraternity, Omega Psi Phi. Uh, thank uh, all of you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Calhoun and others. I have seen quite a few of my brothers here, and I, uh, I appreciate them uh, for welcoming me here. Uh, I also want to make one other acknowledgement. I don't know if she's here. Uh, Dr. Marilyn Hodge, uh, whose son Adam, uh, where is he? Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, I called your name just in time. Um, her son Adam was one of my trusted uh, uh, employees when I served as House Majority Whip, and uh, I still interact with him uh, quite a bit, and I thank her so much. Uh, of course, she's a little bit. Uh, at fault, though, uh, for, um, for Bobby Scott not being here this evening. Uh, now Bobby uh, told me on Thursday evening uh, that he was just finding out that I was going to be here, and he had accepted something in, in Washington and I. Bobby and I are classmates. We, we got elected together back in 1992, and we are very, very close friends. Uh, I'm just getting to know uh, Congressman Scott Vigil, but I've known Bobby for 20 years. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a habit uh, in Congress, of, especially when we're on the floor, uh, of referring to each other as my good friend, and uh, when we really don't mean it. <laughs> uh, but, you know, uh, when I call Bobby Scott my good friend, I really do mean it. Because one of those uh, things talked about in the introduction uh, this evening uh, by uh, Dr. Summons is the fact that um, uh, that whole issue over uh, sentencing, that 100 to 1, uh, that became law, uh, sentencing for uh, cocaine drug convictions, um, because of an issue here in Virginia uh, involving a young lady, some of you, may remember. Uh, Bobby actually brought the passion to that issue, and he would not let go. We failed time and time and time again. But Bobby put into practice something I like to say to young people as I travel around. Uh, in fact, when I give commencement addresses, um, uh, I always uh, said, no matter what level, it can be elementary school, it can be law school, I always admonish that one should never give up. No matter how many times you fail, you just never 
give up. I don't know of anybody who can tell me how many times Thomas Edison failed before he succeeded. And none of us even think about him as a failure. Though we all know he failed many times before he succeeded. Uh, and that is the kind of thing that um, we have to instill in our young people not to give up when they fail. Um, I remember uh, when I lost the third time. I ran for the State House of Representatives down in Charleston in 1970 uh, and um, was declared the winner at 10 o'clock in the evening only to find out the next morning that rather than being a 500 vote winner, I was a 500 vote loser. That was a tough way to lose. Uh, eight years later, I ran statewide for Secretary of State and I got 48% of the vote, but you had to have 50% plus one to win. Eight years later, I ran again uh, for Secretary of State and I got 48% of the vote again. Nobody changed their minds in eight years. <laughs> kind of strange. But then, right after that loss, a friend of mine came up to me and says, what are you going to do now? You just lost the third time. And you know what they say. Three strikes and you're out. I said to my friend, that's the baseball rule. And no one should live their lives by baseball rules. In life, you're never out. As long as there is life, there is hope. And we must always instill in our young people. And I can think of no better time of the year, especially when talking to young people, than Black History Month than for us to really instill that in the minds and hopefully the hearts of our young people. And that brings me to what I would like to share with you. Now they, they said that this is an evening with Jim Clyburn and I walked in here and I saw these two mics and I know what that means. <laughs> that means you don't want to hear me give a long speech because you got some questions you want to ask. And I promise each and every one of you that I will respond to every one of your questions and I might even answer one or two. <laughs> now, when I mentioned the Urban League, uh, I mentioned it because of this. I grew up in the little town of Sumter, about an hour's drive from our capital, Columbia. I grew up at a time when things had begun to churn uh, on the civil rights front. I grew up uh, at the time the courts in the famous uh, a case that uh, doesn't get much mentioned, Elmo versus Rice, uh, opened up uh, the white only Democratic primary uh, to black voters in South Carolina. I grew up at a time in the case that all of us know by its final name, but few of us know uh, by its original name, Briggs v. Elliott, out of the little town of Summerton, South Carolina, uh, the first case uh, of the five that became known as Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, the Brown decision. I grew up knowing the people who uh, interacted with each other to form the various coalitions that were necessary uh, to meet with the success that they finally achieved in 1954. And I remember uh, and, uh, often uh, there being disagreements in whether the way that the NAACP was doing it was the right way to do it. Uh, developing test cases and 
and going to court in order to tear down uh, those legal barriers. That was the NAACP's way. Then there was a Congress of Racial Equality, CORE. CORE's method was a little bit different. And their methods were to what we call direct action. And a lot of people argue that, well, uh, that's the right way to go. And then you may recall out of all of those efforts of the 60s, uh, the S Southern Christian Leadership Conference was formed. The, the, we had then the National Baptist uh, uh, Association, and then there was a, a movement, the Progressive Baptist, uh, all following a more direct action, uh, taken to the streets following Martin Luther King Jr. Then, uh, Roy Wilkins was running the urban, the uh, NAACP, Martin Luther King Jr., SCLC, Whitney Young. And I understand there's going to be a movie within the next uh, several days on this life. Whitney Young was running uh, the National Urban League. All three of them had different approaches. They didn't do things the same way. And there was always this debate as to which one was right. All of them were right. It wasn't mentioned tonight, but um, on yesterday I was in Hackensack, New Jersey, and they made a big issue out of the first time I went to jail uh, because I met my wife. Uh, in jail. <laughs> and that's, a lot of people like to talk about that. I, I tell five people, I, I remember very well my first time going to jail, and I remember very well my last time. Uh, the first time, of course, I met my wife. And uh, you all laughed at that, but it's been 52 years now. Jail works. <laughs> there are some people who say, I, I'm still in jail. Don't you tell my wife I said that. <laughs> but <clears throat> the last time I went to jail, I learned a very valuable lesson. And I want to share that experience with you to make the point I want to make tonight, and then I'll answer any questions you may have. I was a student at South Carolina State at the time. It was my senior year. And a lot of the southern states had decided that they were not getting too far uh, with their, um, the laws of, uh, uh, the, I don't know, trespassing laws. Uh, the courts were uh, sort of throwing those things out. So they, a lot of the southern states passed something called breach of the peace law. And South Carolina was one of those states that did so. A lot of us felt that we needed to challenge this new law. So a group of us went from all over South Carolina to Columbia to challenge the breach of the peace laws. Now, when the call went out, uh, I was getting a little more serious about my books. And... Um, I didn't want to uh, go to jail because I really wanted to go to class. But I told them, I said, well, I will come to Columbia and I will help you all organize the march. And, and, uh, but when you all go down uh, and we are asked to turn around, I'm turning around because uh, I'm not going to jail. Don't have time. <laughs> well, <clears throat> on that morning, I got up, went to uh, put on my little three-piece olive green suit, a gold shirt, paisley tie, and went to Columbia. 
Now, when I got to Zion Baptist Church, where we were going to start the march from, Reverend Ida Quincy Newman, who was the field secretary for the NAACP, saw me come into church, and he knew from my dress uh, that um, I had other things on my mind <laughs> outside of going to jail that day to text that, test that law. So he came over to me, and he said, now, Clyburn, there's a group of students over on the other side of the church who are from your high school. And uh, they came over today, uh, and they want you to lead their march. I said, now, Reverend Newman, I'm, I don't have time to go to jail today. I said, uh, but he said, well, 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 just go over and speak to them. So I went over to speak to them. Got over there, and they, um, they told me, we spoke, thank you. <clears throat> and they told me that they really uh, were excited about what we were getting ready to do. I said, now, wait a minute. Now, I don't mind leading this group down to the state house. But when we get down there uh, and they tell us to turn around, we got to turn around. I said, because I got to go to class tomorrow and y'all need to go back to school today. <laughs> so we did. They ag agreed. We got down there. As soon as we got in front of the state house, Chief Strom, the chief of the law enforcement officer for Slade at the time, came up to me and said, Clyburn, this is as far as you can go today. So I turn around to the students to tell them, they say, oh, no, we ain't going back. <laughs> well, Nisa said, a little while later, I was being marched off to jail. <laughs> now, we got to jail, and they arrested, I think, 187 of us that day. And um, they ran out of space. They opened up the rifle range in the basement. They sent out to Fort Jackson and got some canvas carts. And they lined those carts up. And uh, a group of us were sent down in the basement uh, to spend our time on the carts. So about 2 a.m. in the morning, one of those students who had talked so loudly about going to jail. Got a little nervous. <laughs> and so he came over to me and he says, Clyburn, I thought we were going to get out of jail. <laughs> I said, yeah, we are going to get out. Uh, he said, when? I said, well, Reverend Newman is out raising our bail money, and as soon as he raised the bail money, he'll come and get us out of jail, and uh, we ought to get up around uh, sunrise. So he left. He came back a little while later. He says, now, Clyburn, who did you say was raising the bail money? <laughs> I said, Reverend Newman. He said, well, now, is he that little man with the goatee? <laughs> I said, yes. He said, well, he's back over in that corner over there. <laughs> Now, now, I learned a very valuable lesson that day. <laughs> Reverend Newman had no business in jail. <laughs> he was supposed to raise the bail. We were the ones to test the case. The roles got mixed up. He should, it was three days later when we got out of jail. Needless to say, that little olive green three-piece suit, <laughs> which I was on that rifle range, in that cart uh, for three days. When I got back to the campus, I peeled it off <laughs> and dropped it uh, in the hallway, and I never put it on again. Now, I'll tell you that story because 
The NAACP has a role to play. SCLC has a role to play. The Urban League has a role to play. 200 plus men, they have a role to play. All of us play different roles. And if we all play our roles well, some might say, if we all just stay in our lane, if we don't worry about whether or not that other group is doing it right. Just make sure that your group does it right. Don't worry about whether that other person is doing the right thing. Just make sure that you are doing the right thing. If we all play our roles well and that we all do what we are required to do, we can make it through these trying times that we are currently going through. In the Congress, one person can't be on all the committees. We've got to make sure that we make our little part of the world work for the benefit. And if we do that, then we can look back on our efforts as we look back on the efforts that led us to that glorious day in January 2009 with Martin Luther and uh, Barack Obama took his oath of office as the 44th president of the United States. Now, I talk about the president's victory as being a victory on behalf of those men and women who gave so much to lay the foundation for what occurred in November 2008. I look at him taking the oath of office. In fact, when I was asked what that day meant to me, I called it 3V Day. V for victory. But it was also, to me, V for validation. It validated the dream enunciated by Martin Luther King, Jr. that was being played as I walked in here th this evening. The third V was for vindication. It vindicated those of us who adhered to and stayed true to that dream. But as I look back, I think it is time that we apply a fourth V to that day. I believe though I have not been able to really validate this. Thomas Jefferson is often given credit for having said that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Now, I know I'm in Virginia, so I'm going to give him credit for having said it. So I want all y'all to know that the little bit of research I've done, I can't find where he ever really said that. But he gets the credit, and so I can have safe passage out here tonight, I'm giving him credit for it tonight. But that, to me, is what's very important today, vigilance we must be very careful. Because when I was teaching uh, history down in the public schools of Charleston, South Carolina, my students, many of them, 
used to question why it was necessary to spend time learning all of those things that happened way back yonder. I used to say to them all the time, we must always remember that if a thing has happened before, it can happen again. We must always realize that the same Supreme Court that gave us Brown versus Board of Education also gave us Plessy versus Ferguson, also gave us Dred Scott. The pendulum goes back and forth, back and fold. If you watch it on the clock, it goes left and it goes back to the right. It tops out and it starts back to the left. And if we do not impede it, stick a finger in its way, my friend John Lewis would say to you tonight, you got to get in the way. Because if you don't, the pendulum that swung left in November 2008, and which by all indications has been going back to the right ever since. If you don't stick a finger in it, if you don't stop its movement, it'll keep moving and it'll top up. And you might find, as many people are now predicting, that the same Supreme Court that gave us Brown could very well give us another case that will say the Voting Rights Act is no longer valid that could say affirmative action efforts are now unconstitutional. That say, may say other things that will start us cascading downward again in this great country. It's up to each and every one of us to use the time that we have, especially this month, not to remember the great dates or recite the speeches, but to maintain vigilance and hopefully stick a finger in it, get in the way. Thank you so much and Godspeed.